Um, uh, I want to welcome our Facebook family. Great to have you aboard. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we kind of jumped to the gun. We have a few birthdays in the house. It's Diane. Diane had a birthday this, this coming week. Diane, go ahead and wave at us. Happy birthday, Diane. It, Isaac Chacon has a birthday. Isaac, go ahead and wave at us. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Amaya? Amaya? I'm sorry? That right, but Amaya had a birthday. Um, who, who else? Anybody else? Let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Diane and Isaac and Amaya. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, guys. Don't forget free drink, um, a specialty drink at the coffee bar. Um, for your birthday just on us. We want to say happy birthday. Um, again, want to welcome our Facebook family and multimedia platforms. Uh, glad you're with us. We're in John chapter 3, so let's go ahead and open our Bibles there, and we'll start with a prayer. Father, thank you for your amazing grace that you extend to us every single day. And Lord, as we approach um, your word this morning, I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit and your presence, Lord, would just, um, just shower upon us. Lord, that would just envelope us. And Lord, that we would hear your message and we'd realize we'd absorb it for ourselves, but also, Lord, to take out to our family and friends that so desperately need to hear this particular message. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. And amen. Well, listen, shortly after Jesus began his ministry, Jesus and his disciples and some of his family members traveled across Israel to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. Everybody said out loud they were celebrating what? Passover. So just shortly after Jesus, just a week or so after Jesus started his ministry, he gathers a few of the disciples that he had already um, acquired and, and a few family members. They travel um, south towards Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Now, Passover was a celebration that commemorated the Jewish deliverance from Egypt. You know, when God saved them by the blood of the Lamb. You know, that period when the death angel passed over those whose homes were covered by the blood of the Lamb. That's what Passover was a celebration for. And therefore, every Passover since that time in the book of Exodus, since Moses, each adult Jewish male was ordered to bring a lamb to sacrifice at the temple. It was a gift of gratitude and a reminder that they were spared by the blood of the Lamb. But listen, when Jesus and his crew got into Jerusalem and they stepped up on the Temple Mount, they discovered a bazaar. Everybody said out loud, a what? A bazaar. And we talked about this last week. A bazaar was being held in the court of the Gentiles just outside the temple. The court of the Gentiles was where non-Jews and the sick would normally come to seek the Lord. It was the place, the sacred place they would come to confess their sins and find forgiveness and find peace. A place where they could reach out to God and be touched by Him. But Annas, a religious mafia boss, tossed out all of the seekers and all of the sick just to make money. So when Jesus stepped on the, on, the, on the Temple Mount and saw what was going on, Jesus was livid. Jesus made a whip and chased all of them. The, those who bought and sold the lambs and those who were exchanging money that we talked about last week, he turned over the tables, he chased them all out of the temple. Jesus said, how dare you make my father's house a house of merchandise? How dare you derail worship? Now, this act of passion was actually predicted as one of the identifying marks of the Messiah by the Old Testament prophet Malachi. Yeah, the Old Testament prophet said there's going to one who is coming, a Messiah who is going to bring worship back to the temple. He's going to straighten out things. And so, obviously, people began to wonder. The religious leaders, when they heard what Jesus did and saw what Jesus did, were cynical. Their attitude was, who is this wannabe Messiah? And they marched out there to confront Jesus. They 
pressured Jesus. They said, if you are in fact the Messiah, what sign will you do to prove that you are? And Jesus replied, I'm going to destroy this temple and rebuild it. And he used the word resurrect. I'm going to destroy this temple and resurrect it in three days. The religious leaders thought he was talking about the literal temple, and they said, oh, see, it took 46 years to build this thing. They thought he was talking about the literal temple. But Jesus was talking about raising his body from the dead, which he did. There ain't no grave that can hold his body down, amen, right? Which he did. That's what Jesus was talking about. Nevertheless, after Jesus cleared the temple, Jesus was able to do ministry. And that's where we left off. Chapter 2, verse 23, here's what it says. Now, when he was, Jesus was at Jerusalem during that Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Interesting. So once Jesus had cleared the temple, and the disabled and the diseased and the distraught could come back into the court of the Gentiles, Jesus taught them. He touched them. He transformed many. But, everybody say but. But, and say it again. But. Jesus did not commit himself to them. Why? He knew their faith was hollow. Jesus later said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't stand with him. Kind of like the story of a house church in the former Soviet Union. That was a while back, but a house church was going on underground, undercover. As they had gathered in someone's home and were quietly singing a hymn, suddenly two soldiers with rifles barged in. One of the soldiers shouted, if, if you wish to renounce your commitment to Jesus, leave now. Two or three ran out immediately. As the soldiers scoured the crowd, looking at their faces, another two ran out. The soldier threatened, this is your last chance. If you want to renounce Jesus Christ, you need to leave now. Three families stood trembling with their children beside them, knowing that they would be shot or imprisoned because of their commitment to Christ. Then one of the soldiers closed and locked the door and told everyone, keep your hands up. But this time, in praise to the Lord Jesus Christ, we too are Christians. He said, we were sent to another house church several weeks ago to arrest a group of believers. But instead, we were converted. And we have learned by experience that unless people are willing to die for their faith, they cannot fully be trusted Jesus had so much to give those that he had healed that day, but they weren't willing to stand with him. Que lastima. Say it out loud. But, or, or if you're, you know, bilingually challenged, just say, what a heartbreak. What a heartbreak. But later that evening, the sun beginning to set, the shadows are cast over the city, Jesus still walking from the shadows, someone summoned Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's read what happened. Everybody out loud. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus, guys, was a Pharisee, a Jewish religious leader. He was one of the 71 chosen to govern the Jews. See, the Jews didn't have a king. They had a council of men that taught, modeled, and enforced the law of Moses, 
which was the first five books of the Old Testament. That's the kind of leadership they had. 71 guys who basically just followed and modeled and, in, and kind of adhered to the law of Moses. These Pharisees were poster boys of perfection, poster boys of righteousness, poster boys of faithfulness. These guys never missed a church service. And they memorized all of the first five books of the Old Testament. Everybody say, geez. They prayed faithfully three times daily, and they fasted twice a week. They tithed from every blessing. You know, not just their paycheck, but they tithed from their birthday money, the nickel they found in the street, and even the dill seed from their herb plants. They, they would go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and one the Lord. One, two, three. They, I mean, that's how pious they were. I mean, these guys, guys were, were, were like, if they were competing for a vacancy on the Holy Trinity, you know what I mean? That's how they acted. The Pharisees were also guardians of Judaism, the Jewish religion, protecting the law of Moses. They would protect the teachings and the traditions of the Old Testament, making sure everybody followed them to the letter. They were legalists, like Nacho and Nacho Libre. Why have you not been baptized? You know what I'm saying? Nicodemus was one of those poster boys. And he was one of those, actually, who had confronted Jesus earlier in the day, demanding a sign. But after spending the rest of the afternoon stalking Jesus, which was his job, watching and investigating and listening and scrutinizing Jesus' every move. After spending that afternoon doing that, Nicodemus saw Jesus' compassion. He heard his wisdom. He witnessed Jesus' miracle power. And Nicodemus was convinced that Jesus was a teacher sent from God. And maybe... Maybe Jesus would answer a question that had been gnawing on the mind and the heart. And here was the question. What if being good is not good enough to get into heaven? He was asking the question. It was gnawing on the inside. Will I go to heaven and how can I be sure? Have you ever pondered that question yourself? Have you ever wrestled with the doubt that comes? I mean, Nicodemus had spent all his life being the best he could. But what if it wasn't enough? The thought was keeping him awake at night. Hey, guys, when you can't sleep, don't count sheep. Talk to the shepherd. There's no better place to take our questions, our doubts, and our in uncertainties than to the Lord. James chapter 1 verse 5 says it like this, But if any of you needs wisdom, you should ask God for it. He is generous and enjoys giving to all people, so he will give you wisdom. Nicodemus came seeking Jesus for some wisdom. Nicodemus opened himself up to Jesus. He was about to reveal his fear, his flaw, his insecurity. Nicodemus is the one who kick-started the question. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He acknowledged, he started by acknowledging that Jesus was a teacher sent from God. Let's go ahead and read it, verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus guys had addressed Jesus, you know, the, after, shh, 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 Jesus. I know you are a teacher come from God. I know that you're anointed rabbi. 
and I need some learning. I need some education. And that's when Jesus cut him off and said, you don't need more education, Nicodemus. You need to be born again. Nicodemus hadn't even asked his question, yet Jesus answered it. Want to know why? Jesus was in a hurry to make known the way to heaven. Jesus doesn't want any of us to be uncertain. He wants us to have security, confidence, clarity. So Jesus declared, being good isn't enough. You must be born again to get into heaven. And guys, it wasn't a suggestion, it wasn't an option, it wasn't an opinion, it wasn't a recommendation. It was an imperative. Say it out loud with me. You must be born again. Say it again. You must. It's an imperative. But what was Jesus talking about? Nicodemus was about as confused as a goat on AstroTurf, you know what I mean? Or he was about as confused as a blind person at a bingo game, you know? Why do we need to be born again? And how are we born again? Well, thank God, even though Nicodemus was confused, thank God he asked the question, Right? Because you know what? If he hadn't asked, you and I wouldn't know the details. And here's what he said. Nicodemus said to Jesus, well, then how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it's going. So, in ev so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, I, I mean, don't you have a degree in this? I, I mean, haven't you been reading the Bible? What's going on? Are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So Nicodemus comes over to Jesus and draws him out. He had a question on his heart, hoping Jesus can answer it. And, and, and before he can even ask the question, Jesus explained that in order to secure heaven as our home, we need to be born again. We need to be born of water and spirit. Everybody say, and spirit. We need to be born of water and spirit. Now, we've all been born of water, which is symbolic for physical birth, the water of your womb. But we must be born again. We must have a spiritual birth. Be born of the Spirit. Guys, because our physical lives, our flesh is flawed. Go ahead and give your, your neighbor the, the stink eye look. Go ahead and give it to him. Yeah. Give him that look of suspicion. Our flesh is flawed. We need to be born again because the flesh is flawed. Say it out loud. What? The flesh is flawed. We've been infected with an incurable virus, way worse than COVID-19. This incurable virus has been passed down to us from our parents. So along with your freckles and your dimples and your receding hairline and your unibrow, you also got sin and death. Say it out loud. You got what? This is the generational curse that the Bible talks about. Everyone is born with a generational curse because of Adam and Eve. Their rebellion and disobedience jacked us up. Because of them, we are all sinners. We're all flawed with a sin nature. And guys, if you have trouble believing that, because like Esqueleto, you only believe in science... 
Consider some toddlers. Any toddler. Consider toddlers. No one teaches them how to be stingy, how to be hateful, how to be demanding. I mean, they, they feed me, change me, comfort me, entertain me. Nobody teaches them how to be demanding. They don't take classes on how to be selfish or how to throw a tantrum. Have you ever seen somebody giving a talk? This is, if you really want something, this is how you do it. You just throw yourself and convulse on the floor and scream as that. Nobody! It's in our nature. We're programmed. It's programmed in our DNA. The little darlings that we take home are also little deviants just like you. See, we aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we're natural born sinners. I'm going to say it again. We aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we're natural born sinners. It's what we do. Like the story of the, the frog and, and the little scorpion. The scorpion wanted to get across the lake, but he couldn't, you know, couldn't figure out how. And then the frog came along and the frog said, he, the scorpion asked him, can you give me a ride across the lake? And the frog said, no, no, you'll, you'll sting me if I do. And he said, no, no, I, I, I won't. I won't sting you. Just get me across the lake. So the frog went ahead and did it. And so the, the scorpion jumps on his back, takes him across. You remember, you know the story, right? Because as they're almost getting to land, as they get to land, the scorpion <laughs> strikes the frog. And the frog said, why'd you do that? I thought you told me you weren't going to do it. I'm a scorpion. That's what I do. You sin because you are a natural born sinner. Now some of us might be worse sinners than others, but all of us have an inner gangster. Sweet but a psycho. The Bible confirms it. In Romans it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. How many? Not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we are flawed and we can't buy, we can't earn, we can't work our way into heaven. Jesus said, no one can ascend to heaven and that's why I have come. Jesus didn't come to make bad men good or good men better. Jesus came to make sinners into saints. That's what he came to do. And that was a good place to applaud right there. You missed it. Stop it. Stop it. Let's read what Jesus said. Verse 13, Jesus said, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. Interesting. Listen, there are some accomplishments that we can achieve on our own. Career, family, finance, position, title, Fame. Those are things we can accomplish on our own. But there is one place you can't ascend without help. Heaven. You can't get there by yourself. The only way is to, as Jesus said, be born again. Say it out loud to what? Be born again. Have a spiritual birth. Jesus explained that the spiritual birth doesn't happen with baptism or confirmation or church attendance or good works. Spiritual birth happens by faith. Everybody said by what? By faith. And faith isn't just a, a mental agreement. It's a committed action. Right? Understand, that's what belief to Jesus is. Belief is a committed action. Remember I told you the story about the acrobat who walked across the tightrope you know, over Niagara Falls and he did it easily back and forth twice? And then he got a wheelbarrow and asked, who believes that I can push this wheelbarrow all the way across? And several people cheered and shouted and said, yes, we know you can do it. And he said, who will get in? And nobody wanted to get in. Mental assent agrees. Faith gets in the wheelbarrow. 
Jesus said, believe and receive God's gift of salvation that came down from heaven. Trust in me and climb into my cart. Climb into my wheelbarrow. Jesus used an Old Testament story to communicate this. After their deliverance from Egypt, the, the Hebrews, the Jews, were traveling through the arid desert towards the promised land. Deadly serpents invaded their camp, started coming up a, through the sand, and people were bitten, and death was imminent. Moses cried and asked God for help. And God instructed Moses to make a bronze snake hanging on a pole to put it in an elevated location for the entire camp to see. If people who are bitten and dying look to it, God told him, they will be healed, reborn, so to speak. Guys, the Old Testament was a shadow of things that are to come. A shadow is an indistinct representation, a bulto, a, a silhouette. Like the Passover lamb was the shadow of the lamb of God that was to come. Like the, the serpent on the pole was a shadow of our Savior on a cross. He took our sin on that cross, became an ugly serpent. God even abandoned him because of our sin. Jesus cried from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not because of anything he had done, but because of all the sin we had done. If we who are bitten and infected with sin and death will put our faith in Jesus, will gaze upon our Savior in that cross, He will regenerate us. He will birth us anew. And this secures heaven for us. Let's finish our text. Out loud together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him... Now I want you to pause right there. Because we already know that believes isn't just mental assent. Not just agrees with. But it's committing to. It's standing with. So he says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Continue with me. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Wow. Guys, our faith, our committed action to jump into Jesus' cart causes the Holy Spirit to regenerate us, to birth us anew. A new spiritual life begins. And Jesus earth said earlier, it's like the wind. Though you don't see it, you can see the results of it. Born again... All right, we know how. It's by believing and trusting in Jesus, standing with Him, committing to follow Him. That secures heaven for us. That is being born again. Because when we do that, a new birth takes place on the inside of us. Right? right? But how do I know? Because I didn't see it. You know what? You can try to look for it in the mirror. Kind of like that loan officer at the bank sin, sweating this person who went in and for an, that filled out an application. And the loan officer finally looks at him and says, I tell you what, one of my eyes is a glass eye. If you can tell me which is the glass eye, I'll give you the loan. <laughs> so the guy looked and looked. I'm going to tell you right now, you can look and look in the mirror and you're not going to see the born again experience in the flesh. But there is evidence that you are born again. Jesus said it's like the wind. You don't see it. Uh, rather, you, you, hey, but it's there. You'll see the evidence of it. You hear it. You don't see it, but you see the evidence. There's an evidence to being born again. Say it out loud. There's a what? There's an evidence to be being born again. When we're born again, there will be some visual signs 
that confirm that we are actually born again. Would you like to know what they are? Now, take it down. Don't put it up there. Do you want to know? Some of you are already taking the camera out to snap it. Ha! Ah! I'm kind of out of time. Are you sure? This is the litmus test. Because there are a lot of people running around saying they're born again. They're celebrities. <laughs> people who, who, who say, they claim, are they born again? Well, this is how we know. Am I born again? This is how I know. Are you ready? Here it is. The visible signs that confirm that we are born again. Number one, it's a hunger and thirst for righteousness. We want more and more of God and His Word and His church. That, that, that's just one, one of the signs throughout the Bible is that Jesus said it himself, hunger and thirst for righteousness. John later on wrote his epistle in 1 John, and he said, hey, listen, it's one of the, it's one of the signs that you are a born of God. The second one is a clean break from practicing sin. That is a sign that you're born again. A cl- oh, wait, wait a minute, Pastor, because I, because I still sin. You're right. It doesn't say you stop sinning because you can't. Remember, you little deviant? But you can stop practicing. That means doing the same thing over and over again after you know that it's sin. He says you stop practicing. That's one of the evidences that I am born again. I, man, I, it, it, it grades on me. I have to stop it. It's a clean break from practicing sin. Here's the next one. He says, when you're, when you're born again, there will be fruits of the Holy Spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, patience, faith, humility, and self-control. Let me walk through those again in case you, you guys missed it, in case I spoke too fast. Because I I believe when Paul was writing them to the Galatians, he wrote it slow. So you would read it slow. The fruits of the Holy Spirit begin to manifest in our life. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Humility. And self control. Listen, if you aren't experiencing those changes, a hunger and thirst for righteousness, a clean break from practicing sin, or the fruits of the Holy Spirit, if you aren't experiencing those changes, you need to be born again. And Jesus is inviting you to commit yourself to Him. To jump in his cart and trust him completely. You know what I'm saying? So I tell you what. Let's all stand and let's pray. Together and with those that are online. Jesus said you must be born again. And the way that it happens is by surrendering our life and committing to him. And saying, we're going to jump in your wagon. So let's pray out loud together. Father, I know I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I have run from you. I've ignored you. I've even fought you. But today, today I surrender. I repent from my sin. And I commit myself to you. I believe in you. And I commit to follow you from hereafter. Change me. Forgive me. Do a work in my life. I am all yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to tell you, right? You, you say, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel anything. You're going to look in the mirror. You're not going to see anything. But being born of the Spirit of God is going to create some changes on the inside. A little more love. 
a little bit more joy, a little bit more patience. You're going to want to hear more and more of these kind of teachings. There's plenty of room for you. We'll make room. We'll scoot them closer. We'll do whatever's necessary. But you'll need that. So take advantage of that. Feed that. Let's just cheer them. Let's give them a cheer. Praise the Lord. Now, if you've already been born again, but you've noticed the fizz on some of this stuff is gone. Mm. There's kind of been a flat line. Your heart is skipping a beat. Listen up. If your heart skips a beat, and I'm talking about your physical heart, skips a beat, you'll know it. And you'll immediately go to the doctor, and they'll send you to a specialist, and they'll give you a you know, cardiogram and you know, whatever, all, all those things that they do, you know, that they give you. And do whatever's necessary in order to get your heart back in working order. Well, Jesus wants the same thing for you. If your heart is skipping a beat, and you're, some of that hunger and thirst for righteousness is flatlined, then you need for Jesus to come and give you a boost, to give you a jump start. And I'm, that's, not talking, that's not an energy drink, okay? And the way that happens is by you surrendering to the Lord. Jesus can't give you everything he is until you sur surrender everything you are. You can't grab a hold of the Lord if you're holding too many other things. So it's time to drop those things and allow him to revive you, to carbonate you, if it, can I use that word? Some Christians need some carbonation. We need that. We are the light of the world. A city set on a hill. Jesus intended us for it to be a reflection of Him. So put on your joy. Let it begin to... Guys, let it, let, the, let it shine. Look at your neighbor and say, let it shine. Did you learn something this morning? So much in this chapter. We tease, maybe we'll tease a little bit more of it out next week. We'll see what happens. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so thankful for your work in our life, for what you've done, that you came down, Lord, to make sinners into saints. And Lord, I pray, Father, for those who have just confessed to you and jumped in your wagon for the first time. I pray, Father, that you just continue to, to draw them closer to you. And for everyone who has confessed, Lord, you in the past, but has noticed a lack, I pray, Father, that you would inspire them for such a time as this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And those of you that prayed the prayer for the first time, there'll be some leaders standing up here. They have some Bibles, materials that you'll love to have and they'll love to give you. So take advantage of that at this next, uh, after this, this next song. And listen, they're also here for those of you that just need prayer. You're going through some difficulties, some hurts, some pains. Take advantage of that. Don't leave the same way you came. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to smile on you this week and be gracious to you and give you peace. May the beauty of the Lord be upon you and may he establish all the works of your hands. I love you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday. See you uh, next time.